Mahalo nui loa to the students, faculty, and staff of Kahaka Ula o Keilikolani, College of Hawaiian Language. Thank you so much for that welcoming chant, which honors the building we're in, which is Hale Olelo, this beautiful building here at College of Hawaiian Language, which is the host for our discussion tonight. An amazing achievement was unveiled on Wednesday, April 10th. It was so amazing that there were simultaneous press conferences around the world sponsored by the Event Horizon Project, Event Horizon Telescope Project. The press conferences happened at the very same time in Washington, D.C., and in Brussels, Santiago, Shanghai, Taipei, and Tokyo. Sadly for us here in Hawaii, it was three in the morning, but for those of you who chose to get up, you could watch it on a live stream. But obviously they didn't do it for our convenience, which is really too bad because our telescopes played such a significant role in making this happen. The collaboration involved more than 200 researchers, 200 researchers from Africa, Asia, Europe, and North and South America working to capture the very first image of a black hole created by a virtual Earth-sized telescope. There was significant time and money and technology that was devoted to this project, and it really created fundamentally a new instrument with a resolution never seen before. The result, which you have seen, is the first image ever of a black hole. One scientist friend of mine told me that this achievement is so remarkable, so significant, that even now, just days after it was announced, that he believes it is highly likely he gave it odds of more than 90% to win the Nobel Prize. And we're going to learn all about this amazing achievement tonight. My name is Sherry Bracken, and I'm going to moderate tonight's discussion. I'm a news reporter for Hawaii Public Radio here on the Big Island, and I'm also with KWXX Radio here on the island. I host a weekly interview program. I did so for 15 years with other stations, Lava 105 and Koa Country, but now I'm with KWXX. And interestingly, in just a couple of weeks, I'll have the opportunity to talk story with some of the scientists who are sitting before you tonight. The sponsors for tonight's event are Imiloa Astronomy Center in collaboration with the College of Hawaiian Language, the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope, the Smithsonian Array, Canada-France-Hawaii Telescope, and the University of Hawaii at Hilo. And this event is also being live streamed if you leave and you wish to watch the live stream. It's at go.hawaii.edu slash R-U-J. That's, is that up there? I don't know if it is. It is. Yes. Go hawaii.edu slash R-U-J. The format this evening is that we're going to hear from our distinguished panelists, our participants, and give them the opportunity to tell us more about the first ever image of the black hole and what went into this amazing collaboration. As I mentioned, it's more than 200 scientists, and I can't even imagine getting 200 people to collaborate on anything. This discovery, which involved so many significant institutions, has confirmed the existence of black holes, which is a controversial concept that Albert Einstein theorized when he talked about general relativity about a century ago. Now, the members of the panel also want to answer your questions, and so that's important. I've had some questions submitted already, which we'll be posing to them, but we definitely welcome yours. And you have three different ways to pose questions. One is, you can write them down. We have folks who will come around and collect them, and you should have received an index card or been offered an index card at the door. If not, if you wave your hand wildly, the nice folks who are the microphone holders, and I don't see them, but I bet they're here somewhere, there they are, Lisa and Yoke. They will bring you index cards. The other thing is we will take live questions from the floor. And the third thing is if you would like to submit a question on your cell phone or your device, you can go to slido.com and then it asks you for a code, which is EHT, and you can write your question and you can click submit. And it comes right here to Christine Matsuda-Smith of the Bennett Group who will capture them and then give them to me. And by the way, if you need to get on the internet, the internet network, the Wi-Fi network is Lumi Pahiahia Wi-Fi, and the password is Keilikolani, named after Princess Ruth Keilikolani, whose 
the namesake for this College of Hawaiian Language. By the way, if you have never had the opportunity to see the PBS bio of Princess Ruth, if it comes on PBS Hawaii again, it comes on periodically, definitely record it and watch it because that was one amazing woman. And I mean, she truly was. She's my favorite of the Hawaiian royalty, just so you, you have to see that. If you do have a question, and we don't manage to get to your question by 8 o'clock tonight, which is when we're going to conclude, we will put the questions and the answers online, and you will be able to find them at the Emi Loa Hawaii website. And we'll talk more about Emi Loa astronomy in a little bit. Before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to share with you a video that was sponsored by the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope, the Smithsonian Array, the Bennett Group, thanks to Christine, and the University of Hawaii that will put some of this into perspective. Introduce our panelists to you. I'd Are like to. Okay. Now, let me introduce our panelists to you. And I'd like to start with Doug Simons. Doug Simons is the executive director of Canada France Hawaii Telescope. Over here we have Jeff Bauer. He's the chief scientist for Academia Sinica Institute of Astronomy and Astrophysics for the Submillimeter Array and a founder of the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration. We have Jessica Dempsey, who is the deputy director of the East Asian Observatory and the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope. We have Kaiyu Kimura, who's the executive director of Imi Loa Astronomy Center, which if you've not visited, you definitely should. It's right up the road from here. And it so nicely ties in the earliest Hawaiian voyagers with the current Hawaiian voyagers and those seeking the future through astronomy. And in fact, I think Kaiyu will tell us more later, but they're offering a whole series of black hole presentations this month where you can get more information about the black hole. Finally, we have Larry Kimura from the College of Hawaiian Language, who will be talking about the Hawaiian naming. Let's give our panelists a round of applause. You know, I, I'm going to introduce Larry because he's going to talk about the naming, which is really important. But I have to tell you that if you haven't been paying attention, this whole deal the image of the black hole, the naming, the Hawaiian naming, it's gone viral, it's everywhere. I was even watching Stephen Colbert a couple of, actually I wasn't watching it at night, I never watch things like that late at night, but I taped it, and he was so excited about 
this discovery and it's just it's everywhere so it's really a very exciting opportunity for Hawaii and one of the very cool things is this image has a Hawaiian name and Larry Kimura of the College of Hawaiian Language right here is going to give us a little bit of information about that. Larry. Let's welcome Larry. One of our teachers at our Hawaiian uh, medium school out at Keaau Namahio Kalani Pool. And is this working? Oh, it doesn't. Oh, okay. Let's do this. House. Oh, this doesn't go either. All right, let's try this one. Okay. Mahalo nui to Pele Harmon for presenting uh, those few lines of the 2,102 lines of the epic Kumulipo our traditional Hawaiian chant, as the English word uh, is, mele uh, koihonua in Hawaiian. And of course, in our old days, the way we preserved our information was in this domain of Hawaiian chant, mele. So the language, as you could see, I put it up here for us to read now. So now that we have our written Hawaiian language, we can now read it. And thank goodness uh, that we have this documentation that has been handed down through the generations so that we do not forget 2,102 lines. And uh, other, many other, we have other creation, ko'ihonua or creation chants right out here on our wall down the stairwell. If you have time, on this wall we have a Koihonua uh, for the uh, creation of our Hawaiian islands, the archipelago of Hawaii. Therefore, we have many, many uh, documentations, what I call primary sources in our language. This co coincides very much with the work that we do from this College of Hawaiian Language, Kahakaulo Keilikolani, in the restoration and revitalization of our language. So it's very awesome that we could get together with cutting-edge astronomy right here in our backyard, front yard, on our beautiful mountains of Mauna Kea and Haleakala, of course, and be given this honor to, to name uh, something that has uh, been in our... Um, uh, culture for so many thousands of years. <clears throat> and brings us to uh, where we are today. So this, uh, picking up from where we left off, as I, I like to think about it, is very um, personal um, for me, and I'm sure for all our Hawaiian people who identify as Hawaiians, especially as we begin to, uh, as I said, uh, using the example of a people's language, and this year that the um, United Nations has declared this year to acknowledge the interna International Year of our Endangered Languages this year. That we are now finding that in the use of our language, we have the ability to find out things that we never found out before. 
and things that we can appreciate and connect, reconnect with. So again, I have to say that we really uh, appreciate what our people have left for us and that it is documented and available for study and analysis. So what we have here up on the screen, uh, the first, I believe I have 10 lines. I can't see in the back of me. I have to look 11. at this paper. 11, all right. And the emphasis, of course, of this Kumulipo is that it sets the stage uh, beginning with the first 11 lines here of the importance of po, that is the Hawaiian word for this darkness, deep, deep, fathomless, powerful, ceaseless, creative power, po, that continues even to this very moment. And from this stage, uh, the um, organization of what is to come, because in in composing a text, a book, is not randomly put together. And in the domain of higher language use, such as in poetic form, it takes a lot of work. I can see it, I can read it. I don't get to hear it as beautifully as it was just chanted uh, as often as we did in the past. And thank goodness, because I would have missed so many, <laughs> so many important words. Um, so, this uh, emphasis of the power of Po, and it's repeated, uh, the word Po is repeated at least for the first 500, almost nearly 600 first lines, because it emphas it's emphasizing this, uh, this darkness that is so vital, and that this is the essence of setting up what I've said there, Okavale Vale. I don't have it all memorized, but Okavale Vale Ho Kumu Hoduayia, which I'm looking at line number six. This is the rudimentary to begin, the very rudimentary to begin space. And this sets the stage for what is being organized to come. So very unusual in our Kumulipo, it hasn't taken place for those 2,000 lines. It's just saying this is what's going to happen. And when it happens, it happens in a blink of an eye. And that is the wonderful thing about um, me talking with uh, Jeffrey here and Jessica because if they ask, and they do ask me, how did our people know this? Uh, I have to say, I wasn't there, of course. <laughs> but now that I'm talking to you, it almost makes me feel that I'm asking them. Uh, because there's so many, um, I don't know, strange coincidental um, similarities and connections. So when we met two weeks ago, and they briefly started to talk about this exciting event, I knew it was exciting, I could hear it in the tone of their voice, before they got through explaining this black hole confirmation that they had finally, over so many years, accomplished, I already was in this mode of the Kumulipo because many, many of our Po, 100 plus Po references in the Kumulipo also have uh, descriptions. And one of the descriptions I heard that was one, the, one of the first ones I presented to them was actually, it's a hard word, which is simply in English, very, very dizzy, <laughs> darkness. And they went, wow. Then I said, and another one I'm thinking of is Po Vehi. And that is simply this powerful darkness that is adorned in this embellishment. And that embellishment that makes it look nice for our image, of course, is the light. If we didn't have that, we'd only be looking into this powerful darkness and all know that it's there, it's there, but finally now we have confirmation. So, mahalo, nui loa. 
No come on out. <laughs> I have to tell you, Larry, I just find it amazing and magical, just like Jessica has said. I mean, all of that in the Kumalipo, and it so well corresponds to what these scientists have finally been able to bring to the forefront. I mean, kind of makes you believe, doesn't it? <laughs> Jessica. You have been actively involved with this project for quite a while, and we've talked about Event Horizon Telescope and the collaboration. Tell us more about this. You know, what is this? How did you get 200 scientists together to work on a project? How long did it take us? Give us a little more detail so we can understand what it took to get to this point. Uh, I'll try my best. Uh, the Event Horizon Telescope, uh, at its essence, is a feat of human and technological collaboration that has never before been attempted on this scale. And it is, as you've mentioned, hundreds of scientists, but also, and I especially want to mention this, hundreds of observatory staff around the world, engineers, technicians, um, uh, operators, and they have uh, come together across the world, dozens of countries, uh, petabytes of data, uh, and all of them have come together with the purpose of doing the impossible to image a black hole. And black holes, even the most massive beasties that are out there in the universe, because of their density and compactness, are tiny on the sky. And there is no single telescope in the world that could ever hope to image it. There's a very simple relation, which is the bigger your mirror, the smaller the detail you can see on the sky. And to give you an idea of just how big a mirror you need to image a black hole, it needs to be the size of the Earth. And I don't have the funding to build one like that yet. <laughs> so instead, we get to take advantage of this amazing trick uh, of radio astronomy has given us, which is interferometry. I'm not going to go into the math, I promise. But the cool thing about it is that when you have two or more telescopes pointing at the same object and you have incredibly exquisite timing and distance between them, they can act like a telescope which is the same size as the distance between them. And so the, the submillimeter array on Mauna Kea is an interferometer. If you've had the, um, if you've been up there and you've seen the gorgeously cute little telescopes that are sitting out there on the plat plateau, uh, they're acting like this all the time. And then in 2007, uh, the SMA joined with the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope to test this idea for this very experiment. Can we now make an even bigger interferometer with a different kind of telescope? So this technology and the collaboration actually started right here uh, in Hawaii. And then, you know, we went global, literally. And so we've been piecing together all of these, we're using every single telescope on the planet that is capable of collecting this light. We need all of them. And so we put all of these together. And then to give you an idea, of how small a thing we can see on the sky, how small we need to see to see the image. If you used this telescope and looked at the moon, you could see a lahua petal on the surface of the moon. So you're saying the Hawaii telescopes were pretty important. They not only um, started this, um, they are the western anchor point in the middle of the Pacific, and that's really, really important. There are only a few places on the world where any of this submillimeter light reaches the ground. Mauna Kea is one of these sites. And so you can't just put these telescopes anywhere. Uh, Mauna Kea is the only place in the world where every single wavelength from the universe actually reaches us. You said where the Mauna Kea is the only place? Where all of these different wow. kinds of astronomy can be. Normally you have to move site to site. Uh, and that's why we have this array of telescopes on Mauna Kea that are all doing, you couldn't do this with the optical telescopes. Uh, they look at the universe in a different way and it's by layering 
those views that you get this true vision of what is out there. This is overwhelming, really. You know, I'm not a science person. And just hearing this and hearing that Mauna Kea is the only place and hearing how delicate it is to get everything together and you've actually created, in a sense, a telescope that's as big as the world. Impressive. Do you want to add anything? Because I've got a question for Jeff. Um, just one thing, which is, yes, there's all of those people putting them all together. It's kind of like herding cats through a shower. <laughs> Yeah, I still don't get how you got 200 scientists and all their organizations to agree to do one thing in general. So Jeff, you were very involved with this project as well, obviously, and we lay people are told that black holes are among the most powerful phenomena in the universe, and they have massive scientific significance and the potential to further our fundamental understanding of the universe. Help us understand in, let's say, more lay terms, why are they so significant? What should we understand about the significance of black holes? So, uh, black holes are the most extreme objects that we know in the universe. At the center of the black hole, there is a point of infinite density. All of the mass of the object is collapsed down into this single point. It's what physicists call the singularity. And all of our physics breaks down when the singularity is there. That we can't, when we, if we want to calculate something about what's happening over here in the universe, if there's a singularity over here, we can't do it. The amazing thing is that we have, we surround the singularity with what's called the event horizon, which is this invisible boundary, but it divides the inside and the outside of the black hole. And an incredible thing uh, about black holes is that once information or once matter passes through the event horizon, it can never escape. You throw a book in there, you'll never read that book again. <laughs> um, and the power of the extreme gravity inside uh, of the event horizon is so strong that not even light can escape. So once something passes inside there, shine your flashlight up, the light just can't make it out again. So the, the physics behind this comes from Einstein's theory of general relativity, which is about 100 years old, had its 100th birthday a, a few years ago. And, uh, and Einstein's theory has been tested in many ways uh, over the years, but it has never been tested in the extreme environment of the region right around a black hole uh, in the way that we have done a as a part of this experiment. And that's really important uh, because we know that this is a beautiful, beautiful theory of the universe, but we also know that it's wrong. Uh, which is a really incredible thing to say, right? Uh, very nervous saying that Einstein is wrong, but, um, but we have two great theories of the physics of the universe. So we have general relativity, which describes mass and structure in the universe and gravity. And we have quantum mechanics, which describes light and atoms and microscopic particles and how they all uh, interact. And these are beautiful theories. They both work very well wherever we can test them. But they're incompatible. They describe the universe in totally different ways. And it is at extreme boundaries, like the region right around a black hole, where we know those two theories must come together in a new way that we don't know. And that's why we're so excited about studying black holes. So what is this particular discovery going to do for the future of science? Will things change as a result of this? And if so, how do you think that will occur? Well, we're incredibly proud of making this uh, image uh, of, uh, of Povehi, uh, of the region around the black hole, um, because we, uh, you, might, you might think about this in the way that when the Apollo astronauts went to the moon, uh, they looked back at the Earth and they took a picture, right? And what the picture showed, 
continents and oceans and clouds, Earth is round. And we all knew that, right? But when you saw that picture, or when people saw that picture, right, it really imprinted uh, upon people an entirely different view uh, of, of the Earth. And we think that we've known for decades about the existence of black holes. But to get a picture of a black hole is really, really different than just having indirect evidence that it's there. And as a physicist, an astrophysicist, what we really see is we see a very bright future of We've made this image. This is the end of a, a journey, but it's also the beginning of a journey because we turn over one stone and there's so many things we want to learn now. Uh, we want to make a better image, we want to make a sharper image, and we want to push Einstein's theory further and see where it fails, what, we can, what new things we can learn about the universe. So uh, I really see this as a, as a door opening, not, not, a, not something coming to an end. So this isn't the end of your work? Uh, absolutely not. Although we are going to take a little rest, uh, <laughs> especially after this week. Well, you know, one of the things that as a non-scientist and many people ask, you know, what uh, sort of what is the significance of finding something like this out? And so Jessica and Doug, since you both are scientists, I'd love to have you weigh in on this question as well. You know, what do you think this will lead to and why is it important for us, for all of us? Which one of you wants to go first? Doug? I don't have the mic yet. <laughs> he can't get his mic out. Funding? Jessica Dempsey. Funding? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, to, be, to not be flippant, uh, I think that this, I mean, this is the most, uh, the largest uh, result that I've ever had the privilege of being a very small part of. Uh, and when you realize that you're, you're at a, you know, an, a boundary of opening up an entirely new space for people to explore. Um, and I didn't really get that sense, to, to be honest, until this week. I mean, we'd, we'd been so caught up in, in the image and, and the embargo, uh, not saying anything uh, about the image. Uh, and so just this week was when I realized, oh, and seeing everyone it capture imaginations. It's the first question we're asked when you find out you're an astronomer, or you say astrophysicist, and they say, oh, cool, I'm an Aquarius. But anyway. Um, <laughs> Is, is that people you know, say, what, what is that about black holes? It is the first question we're asked. So that's why I think this is so fundamental. Doug Simons, Canada, France, Hawaii Telescope. What do you think about this? So I was in a state of shock when I first saw the picture um, while we were briefing Uncle Larry about this. And I actually had a very hard time sleeping that night because it occurred to me this region of space is so bizarre and I actually lived to see with my own eyes a picture of that. It was just mind-boggling. And I sort of, um, you know, once the dust settled in my brain, so to speak, um, it occurred to me that this is such a technological leap that um, this is just a prototype. This is something that was, as is often the case when you take these leaps, be it you know, the moonshot, that was pushing technology to and occasionally through the limits, and we got a man to land on the moon. And, and the next step is to make this basically operational and to see that this is applied elsewhere. It's, it's a spectacular demonstrator of the technology, but there are targets all over the sky where you can potentially use this and open up the field of astronomy in ways I never thought were possible. Now we have, have this incredible breakthrough. I likened it with Sherry earlier. This is kind of like jumping from an optical microscope to an electron microscope. And now instead of just looking at amoeba, we see the atoms in the amoeba. It, it's a gigantic leap forward. And for me, this is it's just um, a new chapter in astronomy, independent of the black hole, which is by itself spectacular. Um, I'm already connecting the dots to exoplanets, looking, looking at planets you know, forming in other stars, maybe looking at the satellites around those planets forming around other stars with the absurd, you know, quote, magnification that we have. Right? Just, just the idea that, you know, that, that black area in the middle, that's about the size of our solar system. And the idea of slicing through space 50 million light years and take a picture of something that size and share it with the world is incredible. Absolutely incredible. So the physics is fascinating. I'm into that, but I'm thinking ahead, oh my God, we've just 
we've created kind of a, a new branch, if you will, of ultra high resolution astronomy with this technology that is going to open doors that we don't even know exist yet. Doug, while you have your microphone handy, you know, one of the really very good things for Hawaii about this, I think, is that we had the opportunity to actually give a name that has significance. I mean, it just, to me, I can't even believe the connections when Larry talks about the Kumulipo. And Doug, I know you've been involved with a program called Ahuahe Inoa for a while that sort of was the beginning of connecting our culture here in Hawaii to astronomy. Talk a little bit about the program, what it was, how it got started, who started it, and where it is now and where it's going. Now, that's like a five-part question, but Doug, I know you can handle it. Sure. I've loaded it all up. Uh, and I'm going to ask Kai you in your minute as well to, to jump in. Um, so the, for me, this story started about uh, two years ago. And it's a really remarkable story. Um, uh, a man that many of you know is John DeFries, lives over on the west side of the island, um, had vetted this idea of what he was calling a Hawaiian celestial nomenclature. Um, and for him, the idea came from the fact that many in his family had names associated with stars and objects in the sky. And he, he, he vetted this with um, other kupuna, and um, eventually came to the point where he thought that it was a good idea culturally, but didn't know how to sort of actionalize it in astronomy. And um, mutual friend Greg Chun, <laughs> who many of you know, uh, was, was crucial for connecting the dots and said, John, you should talk to Doug. Uh, so I met with John um, back in March of 2017 with a five-page memo eloquently written um, describing this vision that John had of associating Hawaiian names with great discoveries from Hawaiian uh, telescopes. And uh, it was a really interesting, I'll never forget the conversation because he thought it was going to be a really tough sell. And, uh, you know, we're gonna, Doug, we're going to have to figure out how to get the IAU to bend all the rules and we're going to negotiate with the master lease and all that stuff. So, so I told John, screw that. Let's just do this. Let's just do this. I was convinced that the astronomy community would embrace it. There's not a hard sell. And um, uh, I knew that we were leapfrogging ahead, so we'll let the IAU catch up to us in a sense. So we, we went ahead, proposed this to all the observatories that fall at our annual meeting. And as fate would have it, I didn't know it, but a couple of weeks later, I got a call from UH asking for what's called discretionary time. This is basically time the directors can assign to really interesting topics or targets. And, Meaning and, time on the telescope? Yeah. Time yeah. on the Canada France Hawaii yep. telescope? Yeah. And the fact is, a phone call instead of an email told me this is weird because normally it's email me. So this was so hot, he didn't want me to leak the email, basically. Um, and uh, he told me, you know, we've got an interstellar asteroid, and what we need telescope time on CFHT like now. And it actually took me about 10 seconds because I've never heard juxtapose interstellar and asteroid. What is that? And it's very, oh, this thing came from outer space, like really far away. Yeah, yeah. So this is the first object ever to pass through our solar system from beyond our solar system. Very bizarre properties we knew. It was spinning fast, had highly elongated, going really fast through the solar system. So of course, yeah, we changed all the scheduling and we, we started a study because it only had about two weeks before it was out of range for our telescope to see it anymore. And then the next day, it occurred to me that you know what, this is the perfect candidate for what John had in mind. This is the first of its kind. So I gave him a call. We hadn't even formed our working group yet. And, you know, convinced John, trust me, it's going to be good. Going to work it out. <laughs> and he said, yeah, okay, go for it. And then I called Caillou and, and um, gave her a, a, a whole 72-hour window to come up with a name for this because we had no you know, committee worked out at that point. She called Uncle Larry. And that was on a Friday that I got a hold of them. And Karen Meech, who is the lead of this whole program, um, the discovery team, on Monday was going to submit the paper to Nature. And we wanted to get the name in the paper to basically immortalize it and make it official. And so um, uh, they sent me back. I was in an email session with Caillou, the, the term Oumuamua. And I asked, well, interesting, what does that mean? And scout or messenger from the distant past. And Karen was actually in India at the time. I don't know what the time zones worked out to, but immediately sent it to the whole team. And within an hour, we closed the loop, and everybody's on board. They loved it. And the next day, it was submitted to Nature Magazine and immortalized. And a couple of days later, the IAU, in fact, approved it. Um, so we did that. Then um, we actually formed a working group. 
um, Alan Tokenaga and I are um, the astronomers. I've got 10 or 12 community members, uh, Kahakaula, Emilo, et cetera. Um, and then our next program was uh, Hoa Anoa, which again, if you need a name, you, co you call up Larry. <laughs> which basically means call, you know, calling forth a name. And we had a, a pilot program with uh, high school immersion uh, sc um, students, and we tasked them to name a couple of very unusual asteroids discovered in, in Hawaii, actually from Haleakala, that UH had provided to this. And I'm going to take a slight uh, left turn here, uh, Cheryl. You know I never follow the rules. So just before I came here tonight, I, I asked, know that, Doug, about you. <laughs> I, asked, I asked Alan Tokanaga, can you look up and see if the names that those students, you pass that to Caillou, if the names of those students have proposed to be the official adopted names for those asteroids had been approved. And it's fate or blind luck. They had just been approved by the International Astronomical Union. I'm going to ask Caillou to read the official words that are in the, the uh, IU circular that makes this permanent in astronomy records. So Caillou, can you read those too, please? Um, so, Ka Epa o Ka A Vela, 2016 Louder. HO2. Louder. Hold Sorry. Ka Epa o Ka A He apana hoku nai i lele mai kona kino nui, he holopu me kahonua apuni kala. Kamoa lava alludes to a celestial object that is oscillating like its path in the sky as viewed from the earth. It is the name found in the Hawaiian chant Kumulipo. Um, Conceived by Ahua Heinoa Imiloa Astronomy Center of Hawaii. That's the first name. The second name is Kaepa o Kaa Vela. He hoa hoku na i e epa no Kaa Vela. E holo e koa ana makapoe la. In the Hawaiian language, Kaepa o Kaa Vela means the mischievous, opposite moving companion of Jupiter, evoking the image of a retrograde object of unknown origin. Again, name con conceived by Ahua Heinoa, Imiloa Astronomy Center of Hawaii. So. So with that, we are officially three for three with getting these Hawaiian-inspired names here adopted by the IAU. If you Google uh, Povehi, um, you will see page after page after page of media hits. It went viral today, if you haven't figured that out yet. And I'm pretty sure we're on our way for four for four in this whole program. And um, I'll just fast forward. It was a few weeks ago that Jess contacted me because she knew that in Hawaii we needed professional help, basically the cavalry to come over from media. Otherwise, we'd be looking on the mainland and sort of the outside of the party. We knew it was a gigantic, you know, um, announcement that the NSF was going to make. So we recruited the great team, Christine Leesom, uh, Matsuda Smith, or Bennett Group, to help us out. All the media coverage that you saw here in Hawaii, that was all produced and packaged and ready to roll at exactly 3 a.m. Hawaii time when the, everything, the embargo was released. And we wanted to make sure that Hawaii had, um, they were part of the celebration around the world. And, and you all knew how big a role that we here um, in Hawaii, and particularly here on Hawaii Island, uh, played with that. A few weeks before that, we were planning this all out. And we you know the first bilingual press release, for example, was part of this. And it occurred to me that, you know, at least 100 papers on M87 has been theorized for a long time. There's a black hole. Nobody's ever named or designated the black hole, ever, because it's never been detected. There's no need for a name. And on top of that, the IAU has no rules for a name for black holes. So in my playbook, if there are no rules, you make them up as you go along. <laughs> so we decided in that telecon, and Jess took it from there, we should go for it. And, and we should make this officially named um, with a, a Hawaiian name as part of the Hohe No program. That's when Jess and Jeff briefed Larry. He saw it at you know, the epiphany. We all had it with him. And um, you know the rest is history, as they say. So it's a, it's been a great journey. It's a super fun program. I really love working with the team here. Uh, it's now home at Emi Law, where it should be. And um, we've already got the next target picked out for a name, and all kinds of cool things queued up over the next year. You're going to hear more about this. This is not a fly-by-night operation. We're going forward in all kinds of interesting ways with this whole program. Today, tonight, it's all about this black hole. But in, in the near future, you'll hear other things about it. Well, you know, you talked about what I think is the International Astronomical Union. Well, I found it pretty intriguing that at the 
January meeting of the IAU, normally I would imagine they have a scientist do the keynote speech. But who made the keynote speech at this year's meeting? That would be Kaiyu Kimura of Imiloa Astronomy talking about this very thing as I understand it. So Kaiyu, talk about, now first of all, Imiloa Astronomy has really obviously been playing a really significant role in this, sort of connecting the culture with the astronomy. Uh, talk about that. And all, you know, basically, what did you tell the IAU folks? Because I don't imagine they had had a cultural practitioner do their keynote maybe ever, right? So tell us a little bit more. Well, aloha kako, mahalo for being here tonight. And uh, it's an honor and privilege to share our experiences over the past couple of years now. Imilo has been open for 13 years, uh, and prior to that it took five years to build. Imilo is a product, or it's a child of a combination of these incredible bodies of knowledge. Uh, our Hawaiian historical, traditional knowledge, and modern astronomical research. And we have the very fortunate, uh, fortune and privilege every day of sharing the integration of these two with all of our visitors, visitors that walk through the door, from Keiki all the way up to Kupuna. And so uh, our kuleana, I think, is to steward these bodies of knowledge um, and explore ways of bringing them together and maybe helping to forge new ways of looking at things. Um, I think we're so fortunate to have so much of our, of our ike, of our knowledge, passed down through generations, whether orally or also or written. And it's amazing to see how um, astronomy is learning about these things out there and how Mauna Kea is playing a big role in that. But also drawing the comparison between our very, very old knowledge and wisdom and understanding and having astronomy like um, my uncle Larry said, <laughs> helping, astronomy helping us to, to kind of reconnect with that knowledge and that information in new and different ways. Um, so Ahua Heinoa is one of the, the programs that we are really thrilled about and excited to be able to be the host. But like Imiloa, it is really a product of community leaders and community visionaries who see uh, the opportunity and want to seize that opportunity of bringing together um, or engaging with modern astronomical research through a Hawaiian perspective and a Hawaiian way. Um, so we, um, it's, I, this is the first time I saw this this designation, and it kind of stumps me because we had, like Doug said, um, students from Hawaiian immersion schools work on this, and over the course of two days, and we had hoped that it was going to be officially adopted. It wasn't the main goal, but actually seeing it here printed on an official document, I think these students are going to be very, very proud. And I was very, very humbled when one of them told me at the end of that two-day experience that he had never, um, he appreciated learning more about our Hawaiian knowledge and our Hawaiian origins, but to be able to see images or um, animations of these objects with his eyes and understanding that Hawaii is capturing that information and making it accessible. He connected with that information and linked it up with our traditional knowledge and for the first time it, it brought a different life on for him in terms of not validating, if, I, if you will, um, what our ancestral knowledge has inherently known for many, many generations. Um, so I think there's a lot of powerful um, stories in that. I think there's a lot more synergies to be harnessed between this type of collaboration. I basically shared with the um, American Astronomical Society, which nobody told me until Doug, that it was going to be over 3,000 people sitting in a room. <laughs> and nobody told me it was part of the keynote address at the very beginning. So I show up in Seattle ready to talk uh, about that would, that would be Doug just. not telling you everything. <laughs> no, well, he didn't know. And, and so when he found out, I told him about it. He says, well, you know that that's the opening plenary. That's the, that's the big gathering to start, kick off the entire astronomical conference. Um, so I didn't know. I'm glad I didn't know. But it was, <laughs> uh, it was an experience. And my main, 
I guess, request of the astronomy community is to be open to being this type of partner with indigenous communities around the world. Our astronomical research is not only done here in Hawaii, it's done in many places throughout the world. And with its incredible power and reach and the deep information that it's, it's harnessing, um, Allow that for that to be an opportunity and a platform for other indigenous communities to engage and further empower and advance their knowledge, their language, and their information. Um, and I think that that message was received well by uh, members at the conference, so much so that we've all been uh, invited or encouraged, I should say, to write papers and to um, submit them for uh, review to be included in the next decadal survey, which is basically a huge report that establishes uh, the U.S. astronomy priorities for the next 10 years. Um, and so there is a realization that there needs to be a lot more concerted effort and energy uh, placed on honoring and, and, and working with um, places and people where astronomy is being done. So. I think it was received well. Is there anything like this, like this program with any other indigenous, indigenous peoples or cultures or languages other than what's happening right here in Hawaii with being able to take these objects like El Moamua, the first one, and link them back? Or is this, is this uh, like the first time? We haven't heard anything like this in astronomy, that's for sure. And one of our, our sort of tacit goals is that, in fact, other cultures around the world pick this up and run with it. Uh, we're just going to be, you know, a few light years ahead of them. That's all. Oh, that's a good Not image. that I'm competitive. <laughs> Literally. They're not competitive at all. <laughs> well, my husband, take, who happens to be a physicist, he takes Science Magazine, which I don't really read, but he takes Science News as well, which is written in English for people like me. And I was really very excited when there was a story in there about El Muramu, and it's like, oh my gosh, that's ours. I, I just, I got really excited, because it is a good thing. Now, Larry Kimura, you know, we're talking about apparently a lot more things coming down the pike. Are you ready to give more names? Are there more names possible, particularly if there are black holes? Are there enough names in those 2,000 lines for you to pick out more? Right. Well, Paul Way is the first, and as I was uh, kind of boasting, you know, Paul is mentioned over 100 times, but the descriptions of different Paul are available. So I was saying to Jessica, uh, let us know when you come upon the next one. And, and there must be millions out there. No uh, pressure I, I don't think or anything like has that. <laughs> no pressure <laughs> at all. Yeah. And uh, of course, uh, the names that we just heard from uh, the creation of our um, our Hawaiian immersion students are uh, uh, very significant because it makes our language more meaningful, not only the language, of course the language connects us to our identity and this is important for our uh, people here, our native people here in Hawaii today in this mode, in taking up again where we left off, as I said, and so it's, um, astronomy is very much helping us in that. Thank you so much. So we are ready at any time. <laughs> good, good. Well, it's, it's funny, as I ask that question, the first question that's been submitted from the audience is the name uh, Povehi is awesome, but why weren't other indigenous peoples where telescopes are located consulted for this? And it sounds like we're just at the beginning. Either any of you want to comment? Uh, Can they comment? Uh, Jeff, Jeff's going to yeah, comment. Jeff Bauer. I, I, I think that's exactly right, and I think it's, uh, you know, we, we, we're using telescopes from around the globe, and there are many, many peoples involved, and I think people just didn't realize that you could do this, that you could step out and you could, you could ask and you could, you could have this engagement uh, and, and create this, uh, this opportunity. And uh, I'm really hoping that what, what we've done here is going to create a whole new set uh, of discussions and, and opportunities in that direction. Well, my personal observation of scientists is often that they're sort of, well, other than geeks, which I've, that's, <laughs> I tell Doug he's Thanks. a geek all the time. But they're sort of somewhat inward. <laughs> right. But somewhat inward focused. I mean, they don't tend to sometimes reach out to others. And obviously you all did and reached out to the community as well. 
And I would just, sorry, Kate, I would also say that um, once you've been in the astronomy world for a little bit, actually, the fact is, astronomers shouldn't be allowed to name things. <laughs> there oh, are you don't think M87 is a cool horrific name? Horrific <laughs> names from this other side of it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so it really should have been something which we looked to, I mean, beforehand. But, uh, yeah, I, I, Kate, you please. Well, I was just going to add um, that I think for sure we've taken advantage of the opportunity because we do work closely with the observatories on Mauna Kea, but by no means I think should um, a Hawaiian name perhaps be the only name for these discoveries. I think, um, you know, every culture has a name, well, that can see the Pleiades, right? Every culture has a name, Makali'i, Subaru, uh, Pleiades, Matariki, I mean there are so many names that relate to the same object and I think it, the encouragement would be for other uh, indigenous communities where this work is being done to also contribute to that body of knowledge and from their stories and their perspective. We do have a number of questions and I just want to remind you if you want to write questions down if you have a card, great if you don't these lovely ladies will bring you cards if you want to ask a question from the audience live, we can do that I've got a whole bunch here, but first I just want to mention something, I mentioned that I that Stephen Colbert got very excited I got very excited when he said that one of the scientists had actually called this image the Eye of Sauron from the Lord of the Rings well do you know what scientist he was talking talking about? He was talking about Jessica Dempsey. She's the one. Yay! So I'm writing to Stephen Colbert and say, you know, get it from the source. Find out why she thinks it looks like the Eye of Sauron. Now, what made scientists suspect that the M87 galaxy had a massive black hole at the center? Jeff? Oh, sorry, can you say it again? <laughs> what, what made scientists suspect that there was a big black hole up there? Ah, yes. So M87, uh, although it's a, it sounds like a really boring name, it's named after Charles Messier, M. Uh, and, uh, and Messier was interested, he was a, a 19th century astronomer, and he was interested in finding comets. And he kept getting, and comets look sort of fuzzy on the sky, and he kept getting confused by, uh, um, by other fuzzy things that he saw on the sky. And so he had a catalog of them, M1, M2, M3, M4, and M87. And he didn't know what it was at the time, it was just not comet. Um, later on, people realized that M87 uh, is, a, uh, is a galaxy. It's a galaxy... Uh, much, much bigger than our own galaxy uh, and very different from the Milky Way. You probably know that the Milky Way is a, is a disk of, of stars. Um, M87 is a, uh, is a ball of stars. Uh, it's a, what we call an elliptical galaxy. Uh, and, uh, and it's 10 to 100 times bigger, more massive uh, than, the, uh, than the Milky Way. And then about 100 years ago, people noticed when they looked at M87, there was this weird feature, this kind of jet shooting out of the center uh, of the black hole. And people, no one knew what that was. They thought this is very odd. Um, and more recently, we've come to see all the signs of what we think is a black hole situated there. What we see at the center of the galaxy is this enormously energetic source that's confined to a very, very small, very compact region. It produces lots of X-ray emission. It produces lots of uh, emission in the, in the bright optical. It varies up and down. And it powers this, this, uh, this jet of material that comes out. It actually moves out at close to the speed of light. Incredibly powerful. So we had a lot of signs uh, that pointed us towards the center of, uh, of M87 as a, as a black hole, but we had never seen it uh, up close, which is what you get there. Well, I understand there's a large black hole here in our own universe, and I got this question in advance, and I got this question just now, and they're all about the same question, and that is understanding that black holes will suck in all objects. How close can we get to a black hole without 
One question is being sucked in, another one is being turned into linguini. <laughs> but the bottom line is, how scared should we be? How concerned would you, should we be about getting sucked into the black so, hole that's closest? So I want to point out that the technical term, this is really true, is spaghettification. Oh my gosh, this was, I'm sorry, Chris, whoever you are, I was laughing. I should not have laughed. <laughs> it is not linguinification, it is spaghettification. Um, so here is how you die uh, when you, uh, when you fall into a black hole, which is that as the, the gravity is so extreme as you, as you approach the black hole that there's much greater force on your feet than there are on your head if you're going in feet first. And so you just get stretched apart. Uh, and so that is a process called spaghettification. Um, so that sounds pretty gruesome. Uh, it actually turns out that for really enormous black holes like, uh, like M87, which is six billion times as massive as the sun, um, that, uh, that spaghettification doesn't really happen, that, that the densities are, are, are the, are, are, aren't quite as bad there. Um, but uh, uh, the other thing that we really have to, we always want to let people know is that is that disaster is not imminent. Uh, please, you know, don't stop paying your mortgage, uh, you know, get up and go to school tomorrow, go to work tomorrow. Uh, uh, that, so if you replaced the sun with a black hole tomorrow, exact same mass, put it at the center of the solar system, right, that sounds bad. Um, but actually, the planets would just keep orbiting around exactly the same. The gravity there, exactly the same, far away. Now, it would be bad because we would not get light and the plants would die and all of that. That would be disastrous. Where black holes turn strange is when you get, when you get really close. Uh, and that's where spaghettification takes place. And that's where uh, the really strange effects that we're seeing in this image of, uh, of M87 uh, are taking, taking effect. I'll just keep going since Sherry is, uh, is busy here. So one of the things we haven't really spelled out for you is, is, uh, um, is what's actually happening in this image. Why do we see a ring of light here? And that is because there's, there's very hot gas, 10 billion degree gas, that's very close to the black hole there. And some of it's in a disk that's accreting around the black hole that's flowing in. Some of it's in this powerful jet that's shooting out. But the light that gets created very close to the black hole, it gets bent in its orbit uh, by the strong gravity of the, of the black hole and it gets bent to form that ring. Right? Normally you think of like, you know, you turn on, a, turn on a flashlight and the light goes that way. It just goes off in one direction. But if you turn on a flashlight behind a black hole, then it goes like that. It gets bent by it. And that's what we're seeing here, which is that fundamental prediction of Einstein's theory of general relativity. Just so you know, we have a whole bunch of questions here, and I want to let everybody know that we are going to try to get to as many of them as possible by 8 o'clock. I want to let you know that you will be able to see this again on the Leo TV. They are here filming, and they're going to put it on. I'm not quite clear when. Where's Micah? Do you know when it's going to be on, Micah? Wednesday night. This Wednesday night? This Wednesday Okay, this cup probably Wednesday night, which is 10 plus 7, 17. Okay, great. And all this will also be on the Amy Lola Astronomy website. So, um, one question has to do, well, first of all, you, I think, have explained why the Hawaii-based telescopes were absolutely so critical to this. If this amazing discovery was able to be made using telescopes all around the world, creating, in effect, a telescope that has, is as big as our planet, why is it important to build a, another larger telescope, such as the 30-meter telescope? Um, so that's a, that's a really good question. And the thing is um, that these telescopes on Mauna Kea look at incredibly different things. Uh, and so they're collecting light at different wavelengths from different processes in the universe. Uh, and so, for example, with the 30-meter telescope, 
uh, or any you know, large optical telescope, but when you're getting one with that size, and remember I said size means detail, right? and you're collecting more light, so it's more sensitive, uh, it starts to bring in complementary answers to the sort of thing that we're doing up here. And so it can explore some of this physics in a way that we can't with this image. And you start to bookend and bracket our understanding. Uh, nowadays, uh, you won't find a, an astronomer who works in one wavelength, as we call it. They used to be a radio astronomer or an optical astronomer. And now we, we, we talk about multi-wavelength astronomy. Because to really understand uh, a, a gas cloud, um, or maybe an accretion disk, extrasolar planets. You know, these things really come to life when you look at them in these different wavelengths. And so all of these telescopes and the different sizes of them, they have different instruments on the back of them, some of the cameras, some of them are spectrometers. And so every single one of them is doing something slightly different. And so when you want to step up again with the 30 meter telescope, there are things that you we cannot do with our submillimeter telescopes that the 30 meter will do. And it starts to, just like we're fleshing in this image, it starts to flesh in the understanding of the universe in a different way. But they, it, there's not just one solution or one telescope that can do all of these things. I, can, I, can I add a, a really great example to that? Uh, that for the study uh, of... Uh, of black holes, the, the Keck telescopes have been incredibly powerful for following stars in orbit uh, around, uh, around the black hole in the center of our galaxy. Uh, and that's exactly complementary kind of information to what we're getting when we make our, our images using these techniques. And the 30 meter telescope uh, will follow stars even closer in and in even more precision. And comparing the results between those two kinds of experiments is so incredibly rich. On the topic of TMT, is there anything about this that would have an impact on 30 meter telescope? Clearly its existence or its being built is not a scientific issue at this point, but is there anything about what you've discovered that, should it, that would affect how the TMT would be built or would function? Hard, hard to think of anything because it's such a different animal. Okay. I mean, this is like a telephoto with a, a zoom factor of a million. I'm sorry, yeah, a million. Ten to the sixth. We, we normally work in units called arc seconds on the sky. It's one over three to six hundred. Um, and, you know, we'd have a good night of seeing on Mauna Kea, you know, a little under an arc second. This thing works at the level of micro arc seconds. So it's an apples and oranges thing to compare this to anything else, to tell you the truth. It's not just a TMT issue. It's, it's so unique and different than anything we've got. There's, there's nothing to really compare it to. So some specific questions about the photo. Is the image we see false color, what wavelengths are we actually seeing, and what are the dark spots on the bright ring around the black hole? I would take the, um, I actually someone did ask me the other day, said, what color is it? <laughs> and I went, well, it's an invisible wavelength. This is not light we see with our eye. So we kind of made it up. <laughs> uh, so we can, of course, we, we've put a color scale on this, and that's not, the real color in this in this wavelength because that doesn't really mean anything because we color is something we look at with our eyes, and so uh, I think that personally I think it's the perfect color for it given what we're describing. Right? We're describing this light which is coming from this incredibly hot plasma. So instinctively, orange to me makes sense, uh, but it is invisible light. So this is a wavelength far away from that which we collect with our eyes and, and with, for example, the optical telescopes. And it's a millimeter. It's really easy to remember. One millimeter is, the, is actually the wavelength of this light. So are there dark spots? I'm not sure what the dark spots that this person's so, asking about. Does that mean the darker area, perhaps? Well, so, yeah, so let me, I, I can walk you through a, a few bits of what what is, what is there in that image. So first off, we see the ring. 
And that's the, that's the light bending that I was telling you about. And then we see the, the dark part in the middle. That's where the event horizon is. It wouldn't be dark in the middle if there wasn't an event horizon. That's where photons are going into, the, they get bent by the gravity, they go into the event horizon and they don't come out. So that's the second thing. The third thing that you see is that it's brighter on one side than on the other. And that's because the gas that's going around the black hole is going around at a speed close to the speed of light. And there's, a, there's an effect, it's called, the, uh, called Doppler boosting. And you've probably heard of this before, like when a, when, a, when a train is coming at you and it blows its whistle, it goes to a higher pitch uh, when it's coming towards you and a lower pitch when it's going away from you. And when gas moves at close to the speed of light, it gets this intensifying effect that's a kind of Doppler boosting effect. And so we're actually able to know which, which way gas is going around. Now, one of the things we aren't sure about is you, it does look kind of lumpy, right? And we worked really hard on the lumpiness. Uh, and we wanted to know, is the lumpiness real? Uh, is it an artifact of how we made this measurement? And we don't know right now. Uh, and so we have to do it again, and we have to do it better. Uh, and then we'll tell you uh, whether or not that, that lumpiness is real. Lumpiness, is that a technical term? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, just checking. <laughs> if I happen to do a news story about this and I use the word lumpy, you've got to back me up. <laughs> I'll be there. <laughs> okay, we've got several questions that are specific to black holes. First of all, this black hole, Povehi, is 50 million light years away. The universe is 14 billion years old. How many black holes do you estimate might exist? Oh, is this Stump the Scientist? Um, a, a lot. <laughs> Squared, squared. Yeah, squared. <laughs> uh, so we, we uh, there's some there's some places we're pretty sure we know they are. We know we, we we're not for certain, but we're pretty sure that nearly every galaxy has one of these in the centre of them, and we know some of the other processes that go into making these, uh, and they have a range of masses and the way they appear, whether they're just stellar sized masses. If you remember uh, the LIGO gravitational wave announcement, which was what, two years ago now? Four. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> um, so that actually caught the sound of two black holes colliding. Yeah. And this again was another amazing verification of, of relativity. But it also tested a regime with black holes, which is at the opposite end of what we're doing. Because these were, these were actually small black holes. They're about stellar mass size black holes. We are now at the other end of the regime, the big monsters, billions of solar masses. And with two entirely different techniques, we've shown yet again, Einstein was right. So in between there is this plethora of black holes and where we're going to find them. And uh, so, uh, yeah, a lot squared. <laughs> okay. So in the process of gathering all of this information to create this image, what did you learn new, if anything new, about black holes? And then what questions do you hope to answer in the future with presumably even more detailed images now that you've learned how to do this. So it's a compound question. Yeah. So one of the, one of the most important things that, that we did here was we measured, we weighed the black hole. We measured its mass very accurately, more accurately than anyone has ever measured a black hole mass. Now how did you do that? So Did you take your little scale up there? <laughs> we, use a, we use a balance scale. It's very sophisticated. Um, that, so going back to Einstein, so that, that ring, Einstein's theory says, the, the, most, the, the diameter of that ring is set by the mass of the black hole that's inside it. So we, we made that image, and quite literally, I, I, when the image came out, people took out their rulers, and they said, How, you know, what's the diameter of that ring? And, uh, and you read that off, and it tells you 
the, uh, the mass of the black hole. Now the next thing that we did was we asked, is it really a circle? Einstein's theory says it should be a circle. Um, and uh, now it's not perfect, but it's actually pretty darn close to, to a circle. Um, and so that says there are ways that you can make, you can make the, the, uh, an image like that if you change the laws of physics by not, you can make it into an ellipse, you can make it into an oval, you can squash it. If you change the laws of physics, you can do that. Um, and so um, the fact that it comes out so close to a circle says, well, those, if, those, if those other laws of physics are there, then they've got to be really small effects. So what are we going to do next? Well, we're going to really push on making this image better. We want to make it sharper. Um, we want to make it more complete. We want to deal with the lumpiness. Um, and we want to see, is it truly circular when you can do it at really high precision? A lot of science comes from, you know, if you can make a measurement and you can make it precise, then you can answer a really difficult question. Jessica and Doug, why don't you weigh on this? What do you want to learn in the future that you feel you can from this work with black holes, particularly as you get, all the scientists get more sophisticated at it? Well, I'll be honest, I'm, a, I'm an instrumentation geek. <laughs> so, you know, I started out, you know, the, the telescope building was, you know, the background. So really, I get excited by the toys. And so here, for me, as well as, you know, investigating all the science, what I'm excited about is how we're pushing the technological barriers. And so we're getting new instruments into the telescope to make these images more sensitive. Uh, hopefully we get to a point where we don't have to ship hard drives in planes around the world in order to do this sort of work. And so really, you know, you're always moving on. There's like getting a new car every year. I always want shinier toys and better things to do with. And the other thing is that development work. Uh, it trains the next generation of young scientists and engineers. And for me, that's so exciting to do here in Hawaii. Right? I want these instruments to be designed and thought of and built um, by people, young people here. And well, you that's know, an opportunity. I just want to interject and say that I had the lovely opportunity to do an interview with Jessica and with a student, Mylani Neal, who born and raised in Kona, and she's now at Rensselaer Polytechnic University. And she's a physics student, but what she wants to do is, in fact, work with instruments, just like Jessica. And part of that was a recognition that there's a lot of jobs that can be done in the astronomy field. You don't always have to be this guy. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's really cool because it, there's different ways to look at any of these discoveries. It's not all one thing. Doug Simons, what are you hoping will come out of this? So I'm an instrumentation geek as well. Um, so I, on a good day, I pretend to be a scientist. And two things that immediately jumped out when I first saw that image. One, black holes are real. It's just everything but but inference leading into that too. I knew the models were based on general relativity and it looked a hell of a lot like the models so GR applies in a gravity regime that we've never ever tested it in. So, so it's a huge triumph for Einstein. Um, I'm very curious about the next black hole image which um, our friends at EHT are evidently processing and studying. They're being kind of quiet about it. That's the one in the middle of our galaxy. And um, the, you know, the possibility for a non-circular um, shape um, for interesting physics that you simply did not anticipate because we're now so far beyond any lab experiment, any observation we've ever done. Everything is new by definition when we're in this regime of new technology. And the odds of finding things you didn't anticipate when you're out there on your own, so to speak, with this new technology is very high. So I would be surprised if we don't learn things within the next, you know, five, ten years with this technology and other objects and, and the other black holes that it could potentially be applied to. And I, I'm very interested to learn the names that uh, Uncle Larry is going to come up with for new things that we discover. It would just be, again, just fascinating <laughs> if this dizzy thing is and other, uh, you mentioned noise, you know, in the Kumulipo, 
the, the word vava and vava and vava is associated with reincarnating, this black hole is continuously, well, I'm not saying black hole, pole, which is named pole, so now I'm into black holes now, but <laughs> pole is that powerful. So I don't know, I'm, I'm like I'm going back, you know, 2,000 years now, I'm talking to the guys who got together and uh, looked through their if they had a bamboo or something. <laughs> you know, this, this achievement has received recognition in, and it will continue to in scientific journals and in the popular press on the late night shows. What has been the recognition at the highest levels of government, the White House? Have they yet acknowledged how truly amazing this is? I haven't heard from the White House. <laughs> yeah, but you've heard from Stephen Colbert, so what could be yeah, better? Close, close enough. Um, but we were, I think the thing that, well, there was two things that really um, were really special, which of course is that uh, we, we were privileged to meet with Governor Ige on uh, Tuesday, that seems like a long time ago now, uh, and he signed a proclamation uh, declaring uh, the April 10th to be Povehi Day. And that's, every, now we get to have a celebration every year on uh, April 10th. This is incredible uh, acknowledgement and recognition uh, of support uh, for the achievement for all of our staff that work here and also, you know, for these telescopes. So that was really special. And um, Representative Ed Case spoke on the floor of Congress on April 10th uh, and acknowledged this incredible work and really importantly acknowledged the personnel, which just really for me was magic to say how much work they'd put in uh, for people here in Hawaii. So that, those two things I think for me were the standouts. If, if I can jump in and, and bend the rules a little bit, uh, you mentioned personnel, and I, I actually see out in our audience some of our, our team members and observatory staff. Uh, I could be, I, it would be really great if they would stand up uh, and be recognized. Uh. It's always the people behind the scenes who don't always get the recognition, but do a whole lot of the very, very hard work. Well, the, the press conference in Washington was at the National Science Foundation, and that's an entity of the federal government. Is it not? I don't know. Uh, yes. I thought it was. Yes, it is. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> it's the mothership. <laughs> right, so that's a and, good thing, yeah? And, and when uh, the director of the NSF was selected to make the announcement to the world, and yes, there's a seven-minute delay between her announcement and the other press conferences, I understand. That's how finely tuned this whole thing was. Um, that's a really big deal, and um, I think that you'll see NSF involvement in this um, to, to really give it legs in the future. Much as they did with LIGO when the same NSF director announced to the world the detection of gravitational waves and now are sponsoring LIGO. Uh, and it's about a $50 million a year budget that they have, so NSF can carry a lot of weight and make things happen when they decide to do it. Good. And I, I, maybe I can add a little bit more. You know, this, the, uh, the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration is, a, is really a global uh, collaboration. And, uh, you know, you, you listed all the major press conferences that happened, and it really mobilized uh, people around the world, and Justin Trudeau, the premier of Canada, congratulated uh, an astronomer at the University of Waterloo in Canada, and a colleague of mine who's from Poland was uh, congratulated by the Polish embassy in the United States. And I, there's, there's recognition throughout the world uh, uh, of the many contributions of many different people uh, uh, to this project. Well, so what is next for the collaboration? Will it continue? What's the next question you're looking to answer? Will all of these scientists continue working as a collaboration? Oh, it's too soon. <laughs> <laughs> you probably don't want to think about seeing any of them ever again for uh, this moment, right? 
Um, ab yeah, we need a little breath, but absolutely is the answer. I mean, everyone is already putting you know, the, the tracks in front of the train for this next plan. I mean, every single observing run takes this incredible logistical coordination. In fact, we were, we've, we've been scheduling them every year at around March or April. We need just do a 10-day slot because you remember these observatories all have their own thing to be doing. We are asking them to put on the brakes, stop everything you're doing, and just do this thing. And that's, that's a lot of momentum to stop. So we have a 10-day window where we try and do five days of observing around the world, and that's hoping for weather to be good. And this year, uh, for a range of reasons, we actually cancelled the run. One of them was we were uh, trying to get this result ready, but also we had some, some technical issues at some of the facilities. Um, and uh, and a ra so a range of details meant, okay, we're just not going to do that. We're going to push that out to, to the end of the year. And so we're already planning for that run. So that's the next thing. Uh, as I said, we've got a new instrument in place. SMA is, is, is polishing everything up as well, bigger band with the back end. And so everyone is not just saying, yes, we're doing this again. It's like, N no, it's a competitive thing too. It's like, no, we're going to be, bit, we're going to be better this time. You know, we're really going to come in and, and make sure that we really knock it out of the park. And, and so it's absolutely going to continue. And for as, as proud as, and as, as we are of this image, we know we can do better. So that's the thing. Well, the Hawaii Science and Technology Museum would like to know if the next observations will be planned as multi-messenger experiments involving other types of observatories. Uh, absolutely. And, and in fact, that's, uh, that's a big part of what, what we have done up to now. Uh, so multi-messenger uh, astronomy is a, it's a buzzword, but uh, it's a meaningful one. It's, uh, as, as Jessica said earlier, um, astronomers aren't just optical astronomers or radio astronomers. We use the whole spectrum of light. Uh, to, uh, to understand what we're looking at. If you look at the sun, you, you look at it in optical light, and you, you look at it the x-rays, you look at the ultraviolet, you look at the radio, and you see a different picture, you see different parts of the sun, and the same thing is true about black holes. Uh, and so when we do these 10-day campaigns, we get everybody involved. Uh, we get the Keck telescope looking at, 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 at in the optical. We get the Chandra X-ray satellite looking at, at X-rays from it. We, uh, we get gamma ray satellites. Uh, we look for whether or not there are neutrinos that are coming from, uh, coming from the source. All of that's really important to put together the picture of what's happening in these systems. So some questions about, well, I would say Einstein and what he had done. How does this bring us closer to a universal field theory? And does this discovery bring us closer to unifying quantum mechanics and relativity? Two questions. You want to take this but one? I don't know if they're related, so I'm asking them together. Well, so Larry, you've been involved with this a long time. <laughs> that would be the Poe. Yeah, we're all going back to Poe. <laughs> Um, this is, that's a doozy, that's a, that's a brutal question. Well, well it's a very yeah. multiple question, yeah. but it seemed to be, they seem to be similar. So, first one is, how does this bring us closer to a universal field theory? Um, I'm not confident that it gets us far enough to do that. That is a... Um, yeah, that one would be an amazing achievement, but uh, I'm well, the What is universal field theory? Is it able to be explained in 25 words or less for those of us who don't know? Uh, you know what? I bet you there's a word in Hawaiian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, Larry, get busy. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this one over to Jeff. I was kicked out of quantum field theory in university, so I don't think I'm the best person to answer this. So... The, the question is going to uh, something I said earlier about how we want, we know that we have these great theories of how the universe works, general relativity and quantum mechanics, and, and they're beautiful and they work really well in their domains, but we know that they're not, uh, they, they, they can't describe everything because they're incompatible in certain ways in how they talk about the world. And so this is, uh, it has been the dream of many physicists to create 
uh, a theory to rule them all, uh, and uh, sometimes called a theory of everything. Um, and, uh, and so you may have heard of uh, string theory. So string theory is a, is a, is a theory that uh, can incorporate uh, uh, all parts of physics. Uh, unfortunately, it, string theory is, is so crazy <laughs> that there are more different possible universes created by string theory than there are particles that exist in the current universe. Like it just, it, and, and so we don't, we don't know how to bring those together. Um, so it is a long-term vision to use the kind of science that we're doing to, um, to probe uh, that kind of science or that, that kind of question. We'd love to be there, uh, but it's not going to happen overnight. So does this discovery bring us closer to unifying quantum mechanics and relativity? Uh, well, that's the, that's the same kind of question, and uh, we're still... We're, we're, we're still working on it. You know, you acknowledged and recognized some of the people in the audience who are people who have worked on this. Give us a sense of what was happening between 2017 data collection, if that was the year you were doing that, and release of the image in 2019. What was involved? Give us sort of a snapshot in data analysis and the design of the analysis. Help us understand your process. So um, one of the most terrifying things about this experiment is we, we spend all of these expensive ter you know, telescope hours, we have all these people at the, at the facilities, but we don't find out if it worked for months. Because at the time, actually this is one of the reasons that having SMA and JCMT as siblings is really important. Because we're so close, we can confirm really quickly that we're actually connected and synced up. And that's one of the little reassuring bits in our observing. But it's not until we've shipped all of these terabytes of data from each site to a central facility that we start uh, correlating the data and making sure we were even pointing up and connected. So that's the first big one. And we had to wait six months for the end of the South Pole winter to ship those disks out. So we had this huge long wait until October of the year to get those back there. So this was, this was us on tenterhooks, um, making sure, okay, so we got confirmation that we were all connected up. But we were still another near year later before we had an image. That's how, and then the data went out to all of these amazing research groups and scientists around the world uh, to piece this image together. And so it, I think the worst thing would have been that the experiment worked perfectly and we didn't see anything. Um, but what instead happened was it's like, okay, we split up these groups and we had four different groups who were doing imaging processing in different ways. They weren't allowed to talk to each other. Because what we wanted to do was make sure that when they turned up and they said, well, what have you got? If that was the same from those four independent processes, that told us very confidently that what we had here was real. And, and Jeff, you saw the image before me. So you saw it in July last year? That's right. Um, and that was, seeing the image uh, for the first time was a truly astounding moment uh, for me. I, you know, I've been working at this for 25 years uh, in one form or another. And we had beautiful simulations uh, of what it should look like. And, uh, and while I was really confident in our ability to do the experiment, I was not actually that confident that we would get the result that we thought, <laughs> that, that we thought was, was there. I mean, so many things have to be right uh, for it for it to work. Not just the technical side, you know, the telescopes have to work, the weather has to be good in all the places, but, but also that nature has to cooperate with us and the, the light has to originate in the right place and it has to get, um, you know, it has to not be distorted by moving around too much, too rapidly. 
And, uh, and so I was, I was truly a- astonished when this came together. And I can tell you that, uh, I mean, everyone, everyone uh, in the collaboration literally was. I, you, may have, you, you may have seen on Twitter or Facebook uh, some pictures of one of our colleagues, uh, Katie Bowman, who's now a celebrity, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, grinning at the, at the, the picture of, of, uh, 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 of the image uh, that, that she had made uh, that was back in July of 2018. And, uh, and that's how all of us were. We were just giddy uh, that, that we had really gotten what, what we went looking for. When will Mauna Kea have a theoretical physicist to help with joining general relativity of quantum mechanics? I think it says joining. Sounds like someone's angling for a job. I was wondering about that. Do you need a theoretical physicist up top? Doug, that would be sort of your kuleana. No, we just need money. (laughs) (laughs) Um, These are operational facilities, and we basically rely on the brain power of the science teams that use the observatories to address that. Um, so sure, it'd be cool, but um, in the grand scheme of things, not likely. Not likely. No. Okay. We 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 do have within our collaboration, we have a a large and brilliant set of, of theoretical uh, physicists, astrophysicists, who made those simulations, who made predictions of what we would see, who guided us through interpreting uh, 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 what we saw and, and, uh, and what it means and what kind of questions to ask. So will the whole Earth telescope be able to image and do spectroscopy? Spec- a spectroscopic analysis of exoplanet atmospheres? I, I'm going to rain on your parade, Doug. Go for uh, it. <laughs> what, I, Doug's going to say yes and you're going to say no? I, uh, I love the vision that we could apply uh, this technique and this technology to uh, things like exoplanets. But uh, unfortunately, the, the, uh, um, for this technique to work, we, we require the objects to be intensely, intensely bright. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so we're really, we're, we're, we're really only working in the regime of, um, of black holes where there's so much power that's generated uh, uh, around them that produces all of this intense radiation. Anything. But maybe you can figure out how to make it work. <laughs> the two instrumentation so, people are down here. I'm, I'm building something in my brain right now. I'm like, we could do this. We just need to be a thousand times more sensitive, right? Yeah, I haven't looked at the numbers. I would maybe offline we can talk about it. I would be amazed if this is the only object in the sky, or the only handful that you can use this technology on. Um, I think that Shep's reaction at the NSF press conference. Um, to what would you do next? And we said well, we'd add some more receivers um, to boost resolution, but also sensitivity. Suggest to me they're thinking about these things down down the road. So was Einstein incorrect in saying it is not possible to go faster than the speed of light? And as you answer, consider UFOs and reverse engineering of UFOs. Sorry, that have landed at Area 52. <laughs> So first of all, was Einstein incorrect in saying it isn't possible to go faster than the speed of light? And you don't have to comment on the UFOs. Um, So nothing about what we're doing here um, violates that fundamental uh, conclusion of Einstein and his theory of relativity. So while we're talking here about light, which is traveling, of course, at the speed of light, and matter, which is traveling amazing speeds for matter, which is a fraction of the speed of light. Nothing here is going faster than the speed of light. So no, I would say he's not incorrect in that one. Uh, There was something about UFOs and reverse engineering? Yeah. Well, I mean, so well, you, actually, you're the one that likened this to the Eye of Sauron. Okay, so actually, this is your question. Well, well, actually, someone sent me a meme of this today that zoomed in on it instead of zooming out and, and showed the TARDIS. <laughs> uh, 
on the side of this. So I couldn't say for sure that that's not something that's going to happen. Um, and uh, yeah, anything is possible. But uh, I'm not familiar with the particular technology that the questionnaire is referring to at this point. <laughs> I, I, I'll point out, I'll, I'll point out a, a really cool effect. It's an optical illusion that that we see uh, with uh, with 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 jets like the one that that we see in 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 M87 in Povehi, um, and that is that it can look like things are moving in the fa moving faster than the speed of light, um, and it's an optical illusion because what's happening is that um, they're moving towards us, they're being towards us, and they're they're moving at very close to the speed of light. And they're emitting packets of light as, as they come out. And so it's, you can kind of imagine, a, a, a great analogy for this is that, imagine that, that you're, on a, you're on a train uh, going from New York to Los Angeles. And at every stop, you, you put a postcard uh, on another train that's going just a little bit faster than you. And that train is, is, going to, is going to arrive in Los Angeles, you know, a little bit before you do. And it's going to have all the postcards that you put on there. And they're all going to basically arrive at the same time. Um, and, and so it creates the illusion that you've been to, you know, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Illinois, uh, in a very short period of time. <laughs> Did that make sense to everyone? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> okay, but somebody does have a comment. Considering the Doppler effect and the elliptical shape of the black hole, you have a side view whose depth can be measured. Depth can be measured. Yeah, you can read it yourself. <laughs> um, so, one of the remarkable things that we've learned from our very clever theoretical colleagues is that this, the, the shape of this image, which is, is, is really almost totally driven by this strong lensing effect that happens around the black hole. It's the bending of light that's, that's driving uh, that image. And it doesn't really matter a whole lot what the what the particles are doing what that are producing the light they can be spinning around in a disk they can be shooting out in a jet they can just be in a ball uh, around it and uh, um, and so uh, with the exception of, of that of, of that asymmetry in, in the brightness that you see, that it's brighter on one side than, than on the other side. That's the Doppler effect. I really don't know what, it, what, what the questioner is asking about, about depth, uh, but uh, it's very hard to turn this image around and say exactly what's happening in the physics right around the black hole, aside from that gravity question. Thank you. I'll hold on to this, though and study it. Does anybody in the audience have a question they would like to ask live? Yes, sir, we have a microphone right over there. Thank you, Yoke. Oh, I'm, I'm supposed to hold for you. Uh, there were two black holes that were studied. Uh, one of them is at the center of our galaxy. And if I remember right, this is what led to the entire thing of black holes all over the universe to begin with. And we have had no results from that. Uh, is there any information about when we might be able to have the final processing of the image at the center of our own galaxy? If I told you, I would have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, <laughs> we're, 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 I can tell you that it, you know, over the last two years, we've been processing this data as, as, as Jessica described, and, um, and we have built up a huge toolkit 
uh, for how to do this. We've also built this collaboration of 200 people at the same time that we were asking everyone in, uh, to work. Um, it is high on our list uh, to, uh, to get a result on the black hole from the center of our galaxy. Um, it's a hard problem. Uh, it's a different beastie than, than this one. Uh, it's smaller, which means that the gas goes around really fast. Hours. In the time that we've been sitting here in this room, the gas around the black hole has gone a, you know, a quarter of the way around. Uh, you know, it's, uh, so, uh, we're working on it. We may have to make a movie rather than make an image. We're not sure. Uh, yeah, it certainly would, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, do we think maybe this year or what? I cannot give you a timeline. I, <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd have to kill him and then myself. <laughs> so here's a question, Larry and Kat, you, you might want to weigh in on as well as everybody. How do you feel this discovery and discoveries like this help back up the knowledge our ancestors had of the cosmos? And how do these discoveries affect how we see ourselves and our connection to the universe? All of you can weigh in, but it, you know this really goes back to the cultural connection that we have and our ancestors. Well, you know, it's just uh, I, I just think that all humankind uh, has this same curiosity: uh, where did we come from? And for how, for Hawaiians, I know it's very important: where did we come from? And uh, that affects uh, what we are and also affects where we're going. So uh, I don't think it's unusual for any people to think about, ponder those things. And of course, seeing it from, from this surface here and looking around, not just out there into the Albizia trees and all, but beyond is what our people did. I mean, we know about our, our, our Hokulea, uh, reviving these uh, navigational skills. And we know about our Polynesian people going across thousands, millions of miles of ocean. Um, this part of um, man's curiosity and, and necessity, uh, for whatever reasons, but I think curiosity is a major thing in, in this particular question about uh, out there in the cosmos. Lani is that word, you know, that we use. I'm sure you all hear that word, Lani. And that's a Hawaiian word, and it's a very important word. It's, uh, it's not just the heavens. It's, it's about our uh, lineage to our, our great, uh, our kingdom is what the English word is. It was based on blue blood, pedigree, genealogy, and where we come from. It's very important, essential to the Hawaiian culture anyway. And I would just add, I think it, it's amazing, like if we look at the Kumulipo, which is one of many creation chants, um, you know, like, like Larry mentioned, the first 500 lines or so, which is a quarter of the entire body of the mele, um, talk about po and talk about these and very, um, there's a lot of descriptions of pole, which means that there's a lot of different types of pole. I just, I'm amazed at how our ancestors knew that without the availability of modern technology. And then I'm always excited when I hear conversations happen between these people, as Larry's talking about the different descriptions of Po and the different um, ways of creation that's called forth from the Kumulipo, I watch these guys and their reaction and they're just completely blown away at things that he's saying and he's, you know, he doesn't have any prior frame of mind in terms of what they're thinking. Uh, it's amazing to see how they are taken back. So I, I think maybe modern astronomy is catching up <laughs> or, uh, with what our ancestors um, had already observed or inherently knew about the origins of, of our universe. And so eloquently described, if you look at the Kumulipo, it's been amazing now to hear what you have to say about that and to hear that you were able to pull a word out of it that captured what, as Jess, I think you said in one story, that it took you 
papers to describe. Yeah, six, six research papers and, uh, and Uncle Larry did it in one word. And to me, uh, yeah, I just was gobsmacked and, and, and of course he made me cry because that's, that's... Multiple just, times. Mul yes, this, this is now becoming a, a habit. <laughs> Do black holes start, uh, Doug, you Actually, want to wanna, say something? I wanna, yeah, I want to jump in. Can Kristen put the kumulipo back up if yeah. she's around? It's a good time to point, point something out. Yeah, I know. Thing, but, <laughs> so I'm going to out you. So this is Uncle Larry's translation, I'm pretty sure. I looked at it with what you emailed me. And this I, is embargoed. To, to, to my <laughs> knowledge, It's been a stressful couple of weeks working with these guys in the work and, embargoed. And this, so you, th there, are, there are a handful of translations of this chant. And he shared with me his, his translation of the prelude. And I was... Um, um, blown away by the first sentence or the first line. Uh, the astronomers will recognize that as the Big Bang. And um, so I've had the pleasure of, of talking with uh, Larry about the concept of Poe over the past two years intermittently. Um, and my reaction to that was about a year ago, a year and a half. Um, I guess it's kind of my way of trying to relate. Provided our little group with a presentation called The Physics of Poe and the Poe of Physics. And, and that's that was my way of, of hearing Larry's description in a cultural sense of the understanding of the Hawaiians, you know, let me say a thousand years ago. And, and I'm trying to translate into my language as a scientist and then relay it back and then hear him come back to me. And through that process, I genuinely am getting a deeper understanding beyond just the math and the equations of what we're talking about. Um, so so I, I don't want people to get hung up on this being a naming process. The, the names like Omomoa and Povehi, they are pathways, they're gateways. And when you actually go through the process of coming up with a name and exploring where that came from, like he and I have discussed these lines here in his office, you emerge from that with a deeper understanding you would ever get from all the supercomputers in the world working on this. And that's the beauty of what we're doing here with this program. Uh, stay tuned, because I'd like for them to do a presentation on the physics of pole and the pole of physics in the future. You know, I, this particular question and your answer particularly, Doug, is the perfect way to conclude this. However, we have a couple of more specific questions that I want to ask. But I really want to thank you for that last because truly when I look at the Kumulipo and as you said, Doug, the first line is the Big Bang. That's kind of amazing to me. The whole thing is amazing. It's amazing, Larry, that you were able to find the perfect word that captured this in what these folks have been working on for a long, long time. Thank goodness I learned my Hawaiian language well enough, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, one of the things that you learned your Hawaiian language not by going to school exactly, but you learned it from kupuna. You learned it from people who had inherently known it, learned it as children. So I think you probably have a deeper understanding. You don't just have the words, but you have more of the meaning. Yes? yes well, that's subjective, you know, to, to become as fluent as you can. So, do black holes start out smaller and get larger after eating everything around them? Uh, yes, black holes grow. They can only grow. Uh, so we do have to be afraid, be very afraid. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <Okay. laughs> and it, the question is, what would a teaspoon of it weigh here on Earth? Well, well actually, if you turn the Earth into a black hole, it would be smaller than a kukui nut. So imagine all of the mass of this Earth, and if it turned into a black hole, well, it would be a bad day. Um, <laughs> but it would be about that big. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of the density of these, the compactness of these things. This questionnaire notes that all of the telescopes, I believe, in the collaboration are in the Western Hemisphere. Explain why that is, if that's true. Do they all have to be looking in the same direction at the same time? And are there other sites for other observatories? And if so, could that's, resolution get better? Just that's a really, that. really good one. Um, so we are, it, it is a complete, uh, it's fortunate 
that we have telescopes where they are. Um, and so that we can make this uh, these baselines, these connections, without getting onto the other. It's not very good if they're on opposite sides of the planet. That's not going to work for us. So we do need them to be on one side because they need to see the same point in the sky at the same time. Now we are bringing in, uh, so for example, the Greenland Telescope, uh, which is actually... Um, it was, has performed with us, it just did not for this particular set of observations. So the Greenland and the South Pole Telescope have a kind of an Earth curvature problem. And so they will, we will not be able to have both of them in the mix at the same time. But that's okay, we're flexible. And so as, we, as the Earth rotates, we bring them in and out like that, um, and as, as the sources come up in the sky. Uh, but the more the better, as many telescopes as we can, uh, in as many places as we can. That's really the goal. The Earth gets closest to the Milky Way black hole every 18 years. So talk about Povehi. When is its distance to the Earth going to be the best? Every How many years in between? That, that would be your homework assignment. I can just <laughs> tell from the silence. Um, so, um, so I think, uh, I think Povehi is actually moving away from us. Uh, Povehi is in, the, is in as, as we astronomers say, is in the Hubble flow. Uh, and uh, as, you, as you probably know from the Big Bang, the universe is expanding. Uh, and uh, um, uh, Edwin Hubble's uh, originally called galaxies, he called them island universes. Uh, and, uh, and those island universes are, are, are moving apart. Uh, you know, so wave goodbye to Povei as uh, Povei sails off into the into the distance. So we are at the end of our time together, and I'd like to give each one of you an opportunity just to make short concluding remarks, and then we need to thank the audience for being with us because this is great, and thank all of our helpers. So, concluding remarks. Start with you, Mr. Jeff Bauer. Oh, thank you. Short concluding remarks. Sure. Yeah, I'm composing my thoughts. Okay. Uh, should we? Should we? No, 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 no. Okay. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. Uh, um, you know, for for me uh, to be able to present uh, to all of you and to the world this this image, something that I've I've worked on for so long, is uh, uh, is really uh, terrific. Um, what I didn't expect to happen uh, when. Uh, when we had our results and when I was doing that, uh, to end up in this conversation. Uh, and, and that has been genuinely deeply enriching uh, for me and I am very grateful. Well, to follow on what you're saying, I, I joined or became a part of the building of Imiloa, not because I have great astronomy or even scientific uh, background, but I saw the opportunity to grow the use of, awareness of, and appreciation for our language and our culture. Um, and through the years of working at Imiloa and working with people like these sitting up here, it has greatly expanded um, my own appreciation of my culture and where I come from, and it has also greatly expanded my appreciation for um, the work that's being done um, through astronomy. And seeing how, well, exploring the similarities between what astronomy is discovering and what, like I mentioned earlier, what our ancestors already inherently know, um, knew. So I'm appreciative for the opportunity of working with people like this and for the mission that Emilua has to share that incredible wealth and depth of knowledge with our public. Um, so thank you for the opportunity. We hope you'll come and visit us. We are playing Black Holes, the planetarium show daily for the month of April. Um, and we also have a lot of programming coming up in the next couple of weeks to help celebrate and honor the Merry Monarch Festival. So please stay tuned and come back and visit us a little mauka of here at Imiloa. Uh, well, for me, similar to what Kayu has said, that uh, basically, um, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to uh, be a part of bringing a our Hawaiian language to the fore in, in, in this work that we're doing to uh, 
keep our language uh, strong, not only strong, but restore it to where it belongs here in Hawaii. And that's powerful connection through our mountain, Mauna Kea, and as well as Haleakala. Uh, it brings the world to Hawaii, and um, it's so wonderful for the Hawaiian language and culture to be a part of that. So I'm just very appreciative that um, this initiative has taken place and with Ahua Hei Noa and as we've all heard it's a program that we think is very promising as I heard uh, very eloquently said by Doug it's, it's just not about naming uh, in Hawaiian because it's it's the um, doorway to much much deeper and bigger things especially for I have to be a little selfish here, but I'll say it for our Hawaiian people here. And uh, that will actually, uh, as I said, bring us to the world and the world to us. Uh, so, mahalo anui lo. Mahalo anui lo. Oh, my goodness. He just does it to me every time. Um, what the, word, the two words that come to mind, one is humble, humbling everything about this project from the amount of work that went into it from our young students around the world, our young technicians here, um, through to and the tenacity that it took to get through some very frustrating times to where they are and they just deserve a lot of credit, to the humbling of coming to and the privilege of having and learning about another way of looking at this and this gift from Hawaiian culture and history that has such intrinsic truth to it uh, and that has, has bridged a gap in my mind in a different way. Um, again, the word that comes to mind is humble and I'm just so grateful um, that we've had the opportunity to do this and I'm really excited for the conversation that's going to come not just here in Hawaii but outside of Hawaii with um, both the discovery and also this name uh, and I'm really looking forward to that I guess I had the advantage of thinking a little more than anybody else uh, my message is um, for the community it's for the audience and for everybody listening online uh, as a, a long-time resident, and one's got a very close relationship with that mountain, um, the uh, Hohe Noa program, uh, I feel very strongly, um, gives Mauna Kea a voice, it gives you a voice. It's a voice that is literally being heard around the world, and it's a Hawaiian voice, and that's how it should be. That's all I have to say. I'd like to really thank everybody who helped make this forum a reality. Christine Matsuda-Smith of the Bennett Group, Pelly Harmon, our chanter, the sound team, Ray, you and everybody else, thank you so much. I have always told, told people, you can have a great forum, but without sound, you have nothing. So the sound guys are really the most important. <laughs> University of Hawaii, the live stream, very helpful. Naleo TV, you can see this again, and I'm sure you will want to. We have lots of helpers from Emilo Astronomy wearing the cool outfits, just as Kaiyu is doing. They went shopping together. And then, of course, Doug Simons and Jessica Dempsey and Larry Kimura and Kaiyu Kimura and Jeff Bauer. Thank you to the scientists for sharing all of the information and thank you to the audience for asking such great questions. If you want to talk with any of them, they'll be here for a moment or two before they collapse from having such a busy week. And um, I have one person who wants to talk about the sacredness of Mount Kea and I'm going to give that to Kat, you and Larry and let them deal with that because you gave your email and thank you so much. Let's give them all a big round of applause. to do an encore even though the applause <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. This was great. Thank you. It's really good. That was terrific. You were not. <laughs> I do want you guys to put it in this way.